Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our customer data breakfast briefing, which is in partnership with LexisNexis Risk Solutions. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Paige Truelove. I'm currently a policy executive at Energy UK. Um, I've been with Energy UK for about 10 months now or so. So just to start us off before I introduce you to our speakers, customer data is, of course, highly topical at the moment. As we emerge from the worst of the pandemic, knowing who your customers are, what circumstances they find themselves in, if those circumstances will change, and how best to use the data you receive from your customers has become more important than ever before. The energy retail market faces a range of challenges as the industry and our daily lives in general slowly return to normality. Some of these challenges, for example, include how to manage high volumes of customers either in arrears or at risk of falling into arrears, and how to ensure vulnerable customers are identified and present on priority registers. The energy companies that will be quickest to rise to these challenges are those that have the most comprehensive and up-to-date understanding of who their customers are. It's these companies that will be able to respond to these challenges and plan the best for the future. But knowing that there is a need to respond is not the same as knowing how to respond. And indeed, our breakfast briefing today explores four main customer data questions, which will hopefully also inform our discussions as well. These questions are, what are the categories of data we can consider in the energy market? What does good customer data look like? How can it be achieved and why is it so important? What are the common customer data challenges seen in the energy sector and how can they be overcome? And finally, how can good customer data deliver a competitive advantage and support your regulatory obligations? So joining me today on our panel, we have Alan Clay, Marzia Zafar, Sonia Fakini, Lisa Cunningham and Helena Patching. So I'll now turn to each of the panellists to give a, a proper introduction to themselves, their role, and also their perception as of customer data. Um, Alan, would you like to start us off? Yeah, thanks Paige, and good morning everybody. So I'm Alan Clay, I'm the Head of Strategy for Customer Data Management at LexisNexis Risk Solutions. Um, and for those of you that don't know our company, we use data technology and analytics to process uh, customer data. Um, I'll talk about the sources shortly to help organizations make more informed decisions um, on their customers across the customer life cycle. So in terms of our source data, we put a lot of effort into trying to create the most comprehensive source of UK consumer data, but it's not just lists of names and addresses. We want to make sure it's the best connected um, across all the channels. Um, together with being the best described so that we can provide information at the point of contact to help with those decisions. Um, by way of background, the source information comes from uh, two of the main credit bureaus, from public data and from our own sources. And this means that we've got uh, what we believe is some of the best coverage of all UK consumers. Um, this reference data set can be used obviously in this area of customer data management, but also supports things like identification decisions, to, so to say, are you really, really dealing with Alan Clay in a digital uh, contact environment, and also for uh, financial crime and compliance. So as for myself, um, I've been, what I'd like to term is playing with data and helping organisations over the last 20 years in a range of things from creating single customer views um, for some of the uh, big six energy uh, retailers in the UK, um, I spent some time down in Australia learning about the data down there. So I believe I'm sort of well placed to uh, join the other panelists today and share some thoughts on customer data and its impact um, on um, customer engagement. So uh, I think that's enough about me. So I'd like to hand over to Marzia um, to introduce herself. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Hello, everybody. Um... First, I just want to say I'm, I'm looking at this and, and Alan is the is the diverse candidate here in this in this panel with uh, with uh, three or four women and a woman moderator. So that's great. Um, uh, my name is Marzia Zafar. Uh, I work at uh, Calusa. Calusa is a, a technology company. We develop software for um, energy suppliers to use data to better understand their customers and um, and to better engage their customers. Uh, I've been in the energy industry, I was just, as Alan was talking, I was, I was trying to calculate how many years, 25 years. Um, I think when I started, uh, the energy industry uh, had minimal data 
and uh, about the customer. And I don't think we really uh, understood the power of data at the time as well. And fast forward to today, I think um, the energy industry, especially the suppliers are sitting on a lot of data. Um, I think the next step is now how to better utilize that data and how to make sure that that quality of data is, is in a form where we can bring on the customer and, and make them a participant, help them become a participant of the energy transition and not a passive customer. So data, I think, allows the energy industry to transform that, that customer from a passive rate payer and into an active participant of the grid. With that, I'm, I think I'm going to pass it to Lisa. I think I remembered the order correctly. Thanks, Marzia. So I'm Lisa Cunningham. Um, I work with Scottish Power. Um, not quite 25 years, Marzia, in the industry, but 20 years. It's quite a, quite a while. Um, and that's always been with Scottish Power. At the moment, I am the external relationships manager. Um, and my kind of background is, is primarily customer service. Um, over the last 20 years, you know, we've seen massive changes in the types of data that we collect from customers and how we then use that. And I would agree, Marzi, I think we do have a lot of data, um, but it's maybe about how we can develop and use that more wisely. Consumer data for me is a very, very important part of how we can then design and, and deliver the service offering for the consumer. And it's really, for me, it's about understanding the household. Um, you know, understanding customers' preferences and, and how they wish us to use their data really helps us to ensure that the communications and services that we're offering those customers are appropriate and suitable for them. Um, particularly important is the data that we capture around household vulnerabilities. Um, that can really help us deliver priority service register, priority uh, services to customers, you know, like free gas checks and whatnot but also allows the supplier to understand if there's additional support required in that home. Um, you know, some of the data that we're collecting now really helps pave the way for us to understand, you know, could that household be coming into a situation where they potentially would be self-disconnecting or self-rationing? Do they need a continuous supply? Um, and even just in terms of kind of basic data like telephone numbers and whatnot, we can use that data to make sure that when those customers are contacting us that they're getting through to the right, the right team to get the help or support that they need. So yeah, looking forward to the discussion today. I think it will be very, very, um, hopefully very insightful. Um, and I think I am handing over to Sonia now. Yes, thank you, Lisa. Um, I'm Sonia Ficchini. I'm the uh, Senior Partnership Manager for uh, the energy sector at the Ombudsman Services. Um, so as you know, um, a lot of you know already, uh, the Ombudsman offers uh, an ADR service to all energy suppliers as well as uh, communication suppliers. My role as a Senior Partnership Manager is to look after all the energy suppliers. Um, unlike uh, Lisa and Marcia, I've been in the energy sector for a year and a half now, so <laughs> still very new to it um, compared to, to your experience. Um, but uh, I've been in um, account management, uh, data analysis for uh, over 20 years now um, and uh, done a lot of consultancy with uh, uh, businesses um, across the world. Um, I think as an organization at the Ombudsman, we've always believed in the power of data um, to help suppliers understand better their customers uh, from a customer service point of view, but also from a complaint point of view, which is really what we look at. Um, for years, we've been offering um, thorough data pack report to suppliers that, that help them identify trends and root causes of complaints and give suppliers the opportunity to adjust their complaint handling and customer service strategy accordingly. 
Um, since last year, we've, we've added another layer to that. We also um, are, we, we are also offering some consultative sessions to suppliers uh, who are interested in it. Um, so those consultative sessions are um, going a bit more in depth with uh, uh, the data analysis. So what we do is uh, we take uh, the data from the supplier complaints data. That's what we, we really uh, focus on. Uh, we take those complaints data and uh, compare the number of data complaints and type of complaints that the suppliers are, are getting uh, with the complaints and type of complaints we are getting for that same suppliers. And that uh, basically helps us uh, identify the weakest links in the, in the complaints handling for, for a supplier. And what we do once we have those data and we identify those categories and we agreed on them with the suppliers, uh, we uh, do a thorough analysis of all the cases behind those complaints to understand uh, what the, the customers are complaining about, what is the recurring theme coming back. And then we will have a consultation session with uh, the supplier to discuss that and also offer recommendations because uh, the aim of all this exercise is really to share our years of expertise with our suppliers and um, to help them not only reduce customer detriment at the root, at the, 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 the origin, but also um, increase customer retention for our suppliers and help them improve their cost saving too. So ultimately we want less complaint coming to us. And it's not because we are lazy, it's just because we want uh, a better sector for everybody. And I think um, the suppliers who participated so far um, are very keen on you know, really uh, having that same results of uh, customer retention, cost saving, but also reducing customer detriment. So we, we're already seeing some changes and some some shifts in the in the sector with the suppliers we worked with, which is very positive for us. Um, I will pass uh, pass on to Helena now. Thank you, Sonia. Um, so my name is Helena, and uh, I am a data scientist at Octopus Energy. Um, so I joined Octopus almost three years ago, and I guess I'm more used to sort of interrogating and analysing the data than usually talking at an event like this, but I'm pleased to be here and pleased to be a part of it. So thank you for, thank you for having me. Um, so in, within my role, I sort of manage and um, supervise a couple of key areas in, in the company. So me and my, my team work in customer operations, so that's sort of contact rates, response times, and, and trends there, um, as well as finance as an area. So that's looking at customer balances and, and debt provisioning and whether customers are paying enough to cover their consumption. And um, I also look after the, the tariffs and pricing, so sort of what's the cost of supply, setting the rates, maintaining the products. And that's for our standard domestic tariffs, but also our kind of smart smart products like Agile and, and Go as well. Um, and I guess so importantly, Octopus is a, a very customer centric, data driven kind of tech company and data really is kind of important and, and core to what we do to understand our customers as, as others have said and, and really inform decisions that we make. Brilliant. Thank you all. Um, so I've just got a bit of a housekeeping message before we sort of start our main discussion off. Um, so we do want this um, session to be as interactive as possible um, and we will be welcoming uh, questions from the audience sort of throughout the event rather than um, having sort of a short 10 minute Q&A section at the end. So if any of the audience do have any questions for our panellists, please do just drop your question in the chat function, um, in the chat via the chat function. Um, panelists, if you do see a question which is sort of directed specifically towards you or which you would like to answer, um, please do just jump in on that as well. Um, and we also do sort of have some um, poll questions for our audience um, towards the end of the event. Um, and we can sort of um, watch the results coming in live and then I will again sort of turn to the panel and see if you guys have any thoughts and comments um, on the sort of the, the the most popular answers if you're expecting them things like that. Um, so let's just move on to our first discussion, um, which is what are the categories of data we can 
consider in the energy market. Um, so Marzia, when we caught up last, you had some really great insights about this. So I will turn to you first. Um, I don't know if I had great insights and now I, I'm gonna try to remember them. I, I, I think I categorized data into three categories for, across. I said that, uh, you know, we have, we have customer data, which the supplier has. Um, we have, uh, there's grid data, um, I think that sits a lot with, with the DNOs and also with the national grid. Um, so there's, there's the, the customer data, the supplier data, and then there's now as we have uh, moved away from a, um, uh, from a power plan to, to, uh, to uh, uh, from a one directional system, so our bi-directional system, now we also have to look at the data of where the supply of electricity is coming from, uh, because it's not, it's no longer just a single power plant somewhere, it's now we have many power plants all over the place, and we have to keep track of this data as well. So three types of data, uh, generation data, um, customer data, and then um, the, the grid data itself as well. Uh, so those those are the three categories that I mentioned, and I think I think eventually for the for us to maximize renewable generation and for us to have more and more of these mini power plants and and turn uh, uh, homes into virtual power plants, we need to make sure that all the data is in sync and that there is at some point one, one single source of data somewhere that that we that the industry can rely on. Yeah. And if I can just expand on that, Marcia, it's an interesting uh, piece because we have solar panels on our roof. I'm a good, good citizen in terms of generating my own power. But then there seems to be a disconnect with our provider about how we generate it and how we provide our feed-in tariffs back. But I think if we take that customer data element for a moment, um, for, you know, that, that would be the key focus, I think, for today's conversation is we can then break it down into some further elements. So there's um, customer data is around, first of all, the identity. So who is it you're dealing with? Um, and to pick up on Lisa's point, it's not just who pays the bill, but what are the other characteristics of the household as well? So are you living there with children? Are you living there supporting an elderly relative and so on? Or is it just a typical family, if indeed such a thing exists today? So there's some stuff around the identity um, so names, addresses and dates of birth. And it's convincing um, consumers why it's important to provide that. Um, and, and that's a topic we, we might revisit later. I think the next piece around customer data is making sure you've got the ability to contact them. You know, in the old days, it was easy when I first started that, you know, things called email addresses and mobile phones um, were very much unused. But then you've got the, the piece around making sure that you have an accurate email address, an accurate landline, they're still used in a number of cases, but people are predominantly using mobile. So have we got some contact data for them? And then picking up on your final point, you know, it's around the usage, both from a, how much energy am I consuming? Mm. But equally, the other bit, as an energy retailer, is you wanna make sure you get paid. You know, you're not a registered charity, although some consumers, I think, seem to think they are with sort of uh, getting away with using energy and not paying. Um, so, you know, can you get consistent payment? Um, and are they regularly paying? And if they're not, what can you do to stop the debt growing too big? So I think that that would be my sense of just focusing in on that customer, the consumer identity piece and associated attributes, um, accepting clearly that the, the grid and the usage information is, is critically important to the overall business as well. Um, I'm just going to jump in here before anyone else continues. I've just realised that I said the chat function for questions. So um, audience, if you do have any questions, please put your questions in the Q&A function, not the chat function, just to be clear. Um, sorry, guys, carry on. That's OK. Thanks, Paige. I, I wanted to pick up on uh, your point there, Alan. And um, I'd say that as well as sort of properties and attributes about the customer, kind of leading more to the sort of usage that, that you mentioned. I think uh, a lot of the data that we work with um, is time series based and it's very seasonal. And so it's a sort of about 
customers activity over time and, and engagement and those events sort of consumption naturally is, is seasonal but especially if, if a customer's on a fixed ed then that means that debt can be seasonal um or call volumes as well vary by kind of day of the week we know it's busier on a monday um so it's kind of important to understand those timeline of events but also then disaggregate that kind of natural cyclical element sort of is this an expected level of, of um kind of increased volume for given the time of year time of day um or should i be kind of expecting more do i need to kind of up, up my forecast or whatever for for this for that time um and that's only really possible i think through sort of longer term trends or sort of a higher um kind of volume of, of data to really understand that yeah, I, I think that's critical as well, that people talk about data as a single entity, but data is moving all the time. So in the, the, the usage data, as you rightly say, varies, you know, you'll use um, more energy in winter months, you know, it's darker, so you need lights on more. But equally, even that base information around names and addresses, um, they change over time because people move. Yeah. Um, so it's not a case of I've got good data today, happy days, I've put my feet up, look out the window, I've done my job. It's about the maintenance piece is, is critical, together with, as you say, that time series analysis to say, is it the same as the same quarter last year, the same month last year, and so on and so forth. So uh, okay. th th that for me makes the job interesting, is that it's the dynamic um, elements of data that you've got to keep on top of rather than getting ahead of yourself and think you've got it sorted. Yeah, I think I'm sure Sonia and Lisa are going to jump in in a, in a second. So um, I, let, let me just follow up a tiny bit. I think um, for the energy industry to actually meet the, the, the various net zero goals, um, we have to incentivize the customer to use the data. Uh, and we have to incentivize uh, the customer to share that data with their supplier, uh, you know, to, to have those as as they begin to have smart meter as uh, as smart devices in their in their houses, whether that's an EV or electric heat pump, how can we how can suppliers be ready to incentive give them financial incentives or give them that intrinsic value of saying, you know, you have now reduced your carbon footprint by X amount, because no matter how much we need the data, unless we incentivize these customers to share the data and utilize the data, um, the data becomes kind of sort of uh, a wasted effort on our end. Mm -hmm. No, I, I agree. And, and that's why, sorry, Lisa, <laughs> um, I, um, I agree with that. And, and that's what we, we're trying to do also through those complaints analysis. And, and you know, if, if you take the, the categorization we, we're taking at the moment, um, if you take level one or tier one categories, which is customer service, finance, and, and so on and so forth, it's, it's easy to categorize the, 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 the complaints. But if you go to a tier two uh, level, that's becoming a bit more complex because you have all sorts behind billing, you have all sorts behind customer service, and it, it's becoming a bit more um, difficult to categorize those complaints. And, and also, like you said, Alan, it, it's, it's a moving uh, thing because the, the categories we have today might not be the same uh, tomorrow, or the categories we have for one supplier might not be the same for another supplier. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's always uh, a different set of analysis that we need to do, and we need to be, to be agile with, uh, with the data. Um, and, and I think what, what's analyzing, analyze, an, sorry, analyzing those complaints help us with is also um, understand the consumer's perspective a little bit more for, for suppliers and be a bit more prepared for what's coming, which is net zero and EVs and smart meter. And uh, how can we, like you said, Marzia, if, if a consumer doesn't want to share their data with us it's or with suppliers it's it's a big issue because that that's we're flying blind basically um so it's very important to understand what is behind the complaints for us to be able to relay that message to suppliers and say this is how you can better communicate with your consumers or this is how you can better understand them 
And this is the message you can go with maybe to consumers to help them understand the, 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 the possibilities or the benefits of sharing data with us. Um, I'm just going to stop you all there. Thank you very much for your really interesting discussions, but I've just seen some um, Q&A. Um, there's one very interesting one, and it's it's quite related to what we were talking about before with sort of time of use tariffs and everything. So we have a question. Um, so with smart meters and high systems, smart tariffs, et cetera, becoming sort of more commonplace. Um, so um, is there any sort of movements towards looking at where and how sort of customers are using energy within the home um, sort of by identifying this sort of key area? Um, can we sort of tailor products and sort of tailor advice and tariffs around their usage? So I wonder if you guys have any sort of um, more thoughts and uh, sort of, you know, and it would like to expand on sort of how we can tailor advice to individual consumers. I'm going to see if Lisa wants to speak first and then I, I have uh, some thoughts on, on energy insights. I think this is a very, very interesting question. Um, I think with the utilisation of smart meters across homes, we, we are starting to see more data available in terms of how people are using energy, when they're using energy. And I think both Marzia and Alan picked up on the kind of seasonal piece. Um, so that being said, I, I, I think that we probably have some time that we need to use to, to, to gather a, a more kind of clearer picture for consumers. Um, but what we absolutely can do um, through, through that data, I kind of touched on it at the start, is we can start to understand we are if, if a customer is getting into trouble and they're potentially self-rationing, they're, they're self-disconnecting. So these are flags that the supplier can use to understand and um, when, they're, when that customer is engaging with them, get them to the appropriate teams to get the help and support that they need. Um, I think the digital platform has, has given way for, for us to allow a, a different type of communication with customers. And therefore you can kind of tailor products and services you know, to their needs. Um, but what, one of the big challenges I think, and, and Marzia, you mentioned it, um, you touched on it before, is, is getting the engagement from the customer. So as suppliers, we have to make it as easy as possible for those consumers to tell us about their circumstances in the home. Um, and I don't think we're quite there yet. I think there's, there's, you know, there's, there's a, some trust that we need to build um, and, and we need to make it as accessible as possible so that we can then move on to try and tailor those products for those consumers. So I am um, super duper excited about this, uh, about creating new propositions and, and bringing on the customer along, using this data, making as, you know, as Sonia and Lisa are talking about uh, customer complaints, how can, how can we empower the customer agents to have this information ready to talk to customers? So one example of, um, of how you know we here at Calusa are, are are utilizing the data. So ultimately, I think what we want to be known for is providing data flexibility for the supplier, uh, giving them that one source of truth, timely data, quality data, um, making sure that, that the analysis and the reporting is there, and then having an having energy insights for the customer. So, as an example. Um, type of use tariff and time of use tariffs. These are great opportunities for, um, for suppliers to be able to um, incentivize their customers. Time of use tariffs are for those customers that want to take some responsibility for them, uh, take the onus of, of when to use energy and when to not use energy on their own. Type of use tariff is more about um, letting, letting, um, the supplier um, optimize uh, their energy consumption for them. You know, a customer will say, um, will set the parameters for themselves and say, I want my EV charged by X, X uh, time. And then let's, let's the technology uh, that the supplier provides give them the ability to um, kind of sort of have the, the, the battery of that car be a sponge. You know, take in energy when the, when the energy is cheaper and greener and then squeeze it as necessary to be able to uh, give it back to the grid when it's needed. These are, these are all the new propositions that are 
that will be available and are available now because of technology that uh, suppliers can use. So, you know, Kraken, um, Kaluza, uh, Insect, all these companies are bringing these technology, these uh, innovations forward for the suppliers. Now it's the suppliers are also, especially in the UK, because it is a progressive um, uh, regulatory market, it's a competitive market. Everybody's look, all these suppliers are looking for customers. They're willing to, to take on uh, these digital attackers, bring them on rather than go with, with the behemoths of, of Oracle and SAP who may take a little bit longer to provide these propositions. Whereas the digital attackers are saying, we're gonna give you the, the freedom and the ability and the flexibility to innovate for your customers, to tailor tariffs for your individual customers if need be. And that's how I think we're gonna use data to bring everybody forward. Yeah, I definitely agree, Marcy. And thank you for the, the name check on, on Kraken there as well. That um, I agree that it's the sort of, um, the technology and the uh, sort of, um, that enables us to kind of scale from just early adopters to be able to offer this to many more customers to get the kind of green grid benefits as well. Um, sort of either the customers in control or they can trust that, that we're in control and kind of making the right decisions for them. Um, I'm just gonna button here again. I'm sorry to interrupt all your really interesting discussions. Um, so just to move us on to our second um, point of discussion, we've already sort of answered sort of the latter half of it. But the sort of the, the question is, what does good customer data look like and how can it be achieved? We've already sort of touched on why it's so important, especially sort of for vulnerable customers. But Lisa, if you do want to come back in on that again, please do so. But um, even just sort of, I mean, I'm not a data expert at all. So from my own sort of personal perspective, it would be interesting to know what good customer data, good customer data does look like and how suppliers can achieve that. Um, so probably Helena and Alan again, you might want to come in with this, but um, Helena, sort of coming from your data science background and as you're sort of still speaking, um, do you want to sort of give us a rundown of you know, what, what good custom data does look like? Yeah, sure, thank you. Um, so I guess, um, as I said, some of this could, could be a little summary of kind of what we, we've said already, um, but I guess the um, importance is that um, we, Kind of build a, a holistic view of our of our customers um, and and sort of have well modeled and queryable and accessible uh, data so to um, Marzia's point about it it sort of a system being in in sync or being trust um, sort of trusting the data that you have and that it's up to date um, and Lisa as well I think mentioned that it's important that it's shown to customers, but also to, to the ops agents who, who are kind of dealing with customer queries um, to sort of improve the quality and, and, the, and the speed of the service. But I think that um, a customer sort of, when they call up, shouldn't have to explain an action that they've taken last week or the week before with the same supplier. It should be kind of um, in sync and un understood and, um, and another important um, aspect of the data is for it to be sort of responsive and, and adaptive, as we've said, reacting to the different sort of changing needs of, of life. Um, and I think that's kind of not just in what customers have told us or can tell us um, about their own situation, but also what we can um, observe or, or infer um, kind of more quickly or more automatically. Um, so sort of a, a couple of examples from, from when the pandemic hit and when, when lockdown was, was enforced. Um, we, we kind of expect that this would uh, change customer behavior, uh, customer situations, sort of consumption as well. Um, and so instead of having to sort of wait for the lag of EX and AQs to be, to be updated through sort of more infrequent, irregular meter readings, the, the sort of uh, half hourly and smart meter data um, available meant that we were able to kind of respond and, and understand uh, changing um, customer sort of demand uh, sooner. 
and the sort of second example is that we we built a sort of um, an NLP model to classify uh, emails and calls and sort of the call transcripts that that were coming in to be able to see much more quickly um, whether customers were contacting about COVID, about being financially impacted, about being um, kind of self isolating, and so it's sort of using what we can see and kind of infer to kind of bolster our, our understanding of, of customers' situations. Um, let me let me just have share a couple of thoughts. So. Um, in terms of what does good look like, um, there are different challenges, I think. So when you look at usage data collected from smart meters, that's great because there's no consumer interaction. You know, it's a, a machine sending you back information so that you can take it as read that that's good. Um, there's a question in the chat uh, in the, the Q&A about accuracy of data and how do you check it's accurate? And there are a number of sort of specific measures. So there's, first of all, is my data complete? So do you have a, a name as in a full name, not just an initial and a surname and accurate um, address information? But there's a challenge in terms of understanding the characteristics of that person. So the data might be complete, but if they've just moved, it's use, well, not quite useless because you can try and trace it using the old address. Um, but, but if there's somebody's moved, then it's not accurate anymore. So you need to look at that. Um, and equally, um, if the person has deceased, what happens then? So these are all measures of sort of continual monitoring of data. Um, and clearly, you don't want to be uh, communicating with somebody who's just suffered a bereavement um, to say, you know, you owe me a bit of money for, my, for, for, your, for your energy usage. So I think there's... The, 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 the good customer data, and hey, you, you, you called this out brilliantly, which is to say, bring all the information together so that when a customer calls, they feel valued. And I think if they feel valued by any supplier, um, and Marzia, this comes back to your point, is that, you know, let's get that value exchange of good data right. Um, and I see the role that, um, as a supplier of data, the role that we play with you is not to say our data is the best. All our data can do is supplement your data to fill in some of those gaps and to help you with some of those other data challenges. And I think the work that we've put in is to build a pool of data so that you can come to one place rather than having to shop around endlessly to try and make your data complete. Um, and so once you've got that good data, um, then there's the monitoring piece that is critical and most of our clients do that monthly, um, uh, and, but, but quarterly might suffice in, in certain circumstances. And I think it's that monitoring that if somebody's paying up to date um, and they're of a certain family life stage and all the rest, then you might not check, need to check that data as much as somebody who's registered as vulnerable or somebody who's in their 80s or something that, that might be uh, more challenged in their, in, in their lifestyle. So. Um, you know, and good data has got benefits across the board from onboarding, from the whole move in, move out process and so on and so forth. And um, so, uh, yeah, if you can get your data good, make it good in the first instance and maintain it over time would be my suggestion. Um, just one quick example of, of good customer, good data um, uh, in the energy industry, I would say, uh, looking at, uh, at the agent side, uh, agents should have in the same level of information, if not more, uh, than the customer. So for instance, if the customer makes a direct debit request um, and is calling, the, is calling the customer agent and says, I want my direct debit to be this and or that, and they don't want to make it uh, via the, the website, the, the, cust the agent needs to have the confidence that when, the, when that direct debit is changed, the customer sees it, the agent sees it instantaneously. They don't have to wait 24 hours. It's supposed to be right there to give the, to give the customer confidence that, this, that, that that customer agent has that information, is empowered to make that decision. So that's just one a simple type of, of good data that I would say that the energy industry is now seeing more and more of. 
think for from a, a complaint point of view to um, the the accuracy of data and the data we are looking for and we are asking the consumers to give us is, is also very key. Um, when the consumer comes to us, usually there is a degree of frustration or distress um, because they've been dealing with that complaint for eight weeks before they come to us and there was an issue that made it that this complaint couldn't be resolved uh, previously. So when they come and log a complaint with us, we try to get as much data, accurate data as possible from them so we can deal with the complaint and the supplier, we also will get some data from the supplier who will help us understand the situation. And if we have to um, contact the consumer, to it, we make sure that it's because we need additional information and not for to, to, to have the consumer retell the whole story again. Um, so we, we really trying to, to work uh, to make sure that this whole process is smooth and the, the accuracy of data and the amount of data we're getting to be able to do that is absolutely key uh, to, to, our, um, to our process. Um, I'm, I'm just, just gonna bust, oh, sorry, Lisa. I'm, I'm just, just gonna really bust yeah, just very quickly, I think just to pick up on a couple of the points. So vulnerability by its very nature is transient. Um, and Alan, you mentioned bereaved customers. Sonia, you mentioned frustration. A lot of the conversations around uh, customers identifying that they're in a vulnerable situation is a very, very difficult conversation. Mm. So I think if you've got that key data, you know, that core data that you mentioned, Alan, and you're then able to build on that and make sure it's real time. You know, as Marzi, as you said, you know, it needs to be real time onto that account. So when the customer contacts again, they're not having to go back through that big conversation. Um, you know, it's a very emotive subject. You know, some people's circumstances can be really quite stark. And um, so from a, from a data perspective, when you do have that conversation, it's so important that you, you capture all of that and it's there and it's visible for the next interaction. Thank you, Lisa. I'm sorry for interrupting you there as well. Um, I'm just quite keen to get a poll question in because I can see there's a lot of sort of audience Q&A coming and I do want to keep this as interactive as possible. So um, we will have a poll question for our audience. Um, I, it will probably just pop up on your screen now as it has for me. Um, so what is the biggest challenge that poor quality core customer data creates for your business? Um, so once we sort of have some um, live feedback come in, um, it would be great if the panels could sort of pick up the answer and you know what if if the sort of the most common response also if the if the response that was sort of um came out as the most popular surprised you if you have any thoughts on comments and things like that um so yes if you can if the audience can just sort of pick an answer and then we can talk about that yeah so just while we're doing that page there's another question in the ch in the question and answers about how do you create this single version of the truth there's a couple of things there so um when we speak to clients they say uh, and ask about a single customer view often the answer is well we've got two or three of them um because they've got one in operations one in billing one elsewhere so we say no you need that holistic view so um in the same way that we as LexisNexis have joined all of our data together, that technology is available for clients to use. And, and although it's an anonymous question, you know, very happy to have a conversation to share learnings, not just from the energy industry where we've helped people, uh, but from other industries as well. And that leads to another reflection is that the questions being asked here, everybody's got more data, but it's that value exchange that has already been mentioned here. It's the same challenge elsewhere. You know, in the pensions sector, They've got even lower engagement levels than the energy sector because people aren't interested in the pension until they need to draw down on it. So there's sort of some data industry sharing rather than industry specific sharing that, that, that might need to go on to get the best results for, for um, consumers and drive that engagement using learnings from other areas. And I think uh, just to add to that, Alan, I think this is where the, the platform of choice comes in for what's or who uh, the suppliers that that are that are choosing the various billing platforms that, that they're going with, um, will that platform provide that one source of truth? And, and 
so that the agent can take that information, billing can take, can take that information, energy insights can take that information. And I think today that's that's provided here, at least with the digital attackers. And, and uh, I think it's important for us going forward to be able to rely on just one single source of uh, truth for the data uh, to avoid the confusion that, uh, that could ensue. Yeah, completely agree. Yeah, and I, I, if I could extend that and say it's not just sort of the the trust and source of truth within an organization for different roles, but also across the industry, sort of for switching and for um, kind of anything across kind of disparate systems that maybe have separate uh, versions that need to be kept, kept up to date. Um, and if I think a, a sort of better solution for that would be this centralized system, but with kind of more open uh, kind of sharing protocols and via API. So it's more of a, a pull for the, the truth rather than a, a try to keep um, managing different versions of different copies um, would be. As we're getting these answers, I would I, I have two comments on, on, the, on this. One, I think it surprised me that one of the answers is not to enable decarbonization um, because I think, I think we need data, I mean, we need data to maximize renewable generation. We need customers to participate so we could become net zero. So just a surprise that we don't have as an option uh, to enable the energy transition. Um, and then secondly, uh, I, I, I agree that obviously uh, for, for the supplier to, uh, to, be, to stay in business, it's hugely important to build accurately. Um, I am just conscious of time, actually. Um, so we do have a final sort of um, fourth and final discussion point. We've sort of <laughs> gone all over the place, but that is fine for me. Um, but I just want to sort of bring us into the um, the last sort of discussion point that we have today. Um, so let me just bring that up. Um, so the fourth and final one is sort of around reaping the benefit. Uh, the benefits, sorry. So how can good customer data deliver a competitive advantage and support your regulatory obligations? Um, so Alan, do you want to sort of come in first with this, and then maybe I'll turn to Sonia and Lisa to talk more about sort of the regulatory side of things, particularly sort of um, delivering for vulnerable customers and sort of the the, the advantage that that gives you over there as well. Um, Alan, do you want to maybe kick off with our fourth and final one? Yeah, so I think there's that piece um, that if you think looking at retail, perhaps if the brands that win, so everybody's really familiar with Amazon and their profits have gone up massively during the COVID crisis and stuff. But imagine a world where through better engagement, through talking to your customers at the right time, um, meant that you were better engaged and sending out appropriate com communications, getting positive PR from treating vulnerable customers better than anybody else, getting your name out there. And that's got to be key in terms of um, improving the overall engagement, which in turn should lead to better profits. Um, so that's you know, the first aspect of it. The second is, um, it's interesting that the um, introduction of GDPR one of the key principles is that you need to keep accurate information on your customers. Um, but as we discussed earlier, how do you prove that your data is accurate? You might prove it's, it's complete, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's accurate. So I think there's sort of a range of different challenges depending on um, which lens you're looking at it through. Um, and, and just in the interest of time, rather than hogging all the time, I'd like to call on the other sort of panelists to, to share their views um, uh, so that we've all got a time to say something, frankly. So uh, anybody else? I'll, I'll go first. <laughs> um, I, I think um, vulnerability is a, is a big one, actually. And, uh, you know, uh, how suppliers can proactively detect maybe whether a customer is vulnerable um, in their data. So, um, Ofgem has specifically called this out actually in their vulnerability strategy uh, to 2025. And what they say in there, if I, if I can read a little bit, is that uh, we want to see better use of data to enable a smarter 
fairer and more flexible energy system. Companies need to be making better use of new uh, and existing data and record it accurately. We see particular potential for the use of smart meter data, which will allow suppliers to more proactively support their customer when usage changes. So that could be, you know, that could be if a, there is a, a period of low usage or self disconnection. Um, you know, we know it happens with uh, some uh, vulnerable customers. So is that something that that could be flagged up to to um, uh, suppliers? But that, that could also be, uh, like we said before, with, uh, um, you know, the customers in general, with the use of uh, uh, EVs, which will, you know, in, increase their usage, obviously, at their bill. Uh, is there a better way of, um, you know, educating them on when to charge, for example, an EV or when to, uh, you know, use more uh, consumption uh, and, and use less, depending on the time of the the day so it's a, there, there is a really uh, a broader range there of, of things that with smart meters that um uh suppliers can do i think the the only caveat i would say and the only downfall to that is that you know suppliers have to be careful not to become a bit of a uh, or have the perception of becoming a, a big brother where they they are uh, too much involved in in people's life basically through their the smart meter so that's probably the balance the fine balance i would say that suppliers need to 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 find i think just picking up on the, the vulnerability piece so sonia as you say blockchain published their, their strategy but what they've also done is they've strengthened the obligations for suppliers around vulnerable mm -hmm. consumers and, and that's that's a welcomed addition um i think the, the, the core data helps us with things like you know, are you self-rationing? Are you self-disconnecting? Um, from a, a vulnerable consumer point of view, a key, a key piece here is um, promotion of PSR services and then adoption um, and being able to communicate to customers in a way that they are, they, they are aware that they are able to, to join PSR, what it means for them. Um, and as I said before, vulnerability can be a very transient situation. I think through COVID, we've saw a lot more households present themselves in financial difficulty. Um, and, and to be honest, that was expected. So I suppose from a supplier's point of view, and, and keeping in mind our, our um, regulatory objectives and obligations, it's, it's about ease of service for those consumers and making sure that you give them the tools to be able to go and update their account and be able to, to take the services or the support that they need. That's very key. Um, I think I, I agree with everybody, of course, 100%. And I would say I would just add to that that uh, data is needed for us to enable customers to to become energy efficient, to utilize energy efficiency, to utilize demand response. And then at the end would be, okay, if, if energy efficiency is not meet, uh, meeting all the demand and, um, and uh, demand response uh, is, is, the, is the next one to meet demand, then we go to renewable generation. I mean, this is, I'm, I'm repeating uh, California's uh, uh, energy action plan. I'm a true believer of that. Uh, so I, I would say, all of this, our progress, uh, our progress rests upon good data, timely data, and we're beginning to get it in the energy industry. I think as soon as more and more smart devices hit homes, suppliers need to be ready to uh, engage customers and, and give them financial incentives to uh, come on and, and become participants. Um, we did have another poll question, and it's just appeared, and I can't see the results. Can anyone else just before we? Oh, there we go. Um, interesting. Um, does anyone have any comments about this? Is this what sort of we were expecting? Can you all see the results as well? Sorry. Yes. Yeah, to, to be honest, I think I'm uh, uh, slightly surprised. I maybe would have um, only in that I think the kind of reduced churn and better management are more um, 
and sort of better service are kind of more symptoms or knock-on effects from having uh, sort of more operational efficiencies and having and the savings there to sort of be able to pass that on and um, kind of serve customers better for for which then they choose to stay with a kind of for a good experience. So, it, I, but I really, I guess it's hard to unpick when they are so interrelated, really. So it depends what your sort of priorities are. I think um, from our, our perspective, sorry, it's a, it, from our perspective, it's a case of lots of organisations talk to us about um, debt management and so on. Um, and that perhaps because that's where money is allocated and the uh, effects of bad data are recognised, and that's perhaps guiding the answer here. But as you say, Elena, they're all related and they're just part of the, the whole data journey um, and uh, stress the need to keep it timely and accurate over time rather than just at a snapshot. Um, so, right, well, it is unfortunately half past 10 and we don't have another half an hour or so to carry on these discussions, unfortunately. So um, I just wanted to say before we all dial off, um, a really, really big thank you to all of our panellists for their incredibly interesting insight and points of discussion. And um, thank you to the audience as well for um, being interactive and answering the poll questions. And obviously to Alexis Nexus Risk Solutions as well, who have been working with very closely um, over the past couple of weeks to obviously get this breakfast briefing up and running and off the ground. Um, so a big thank you to everyone. Personally, it's been a really um, enjoyable way to start the day as well. And I hope you've also found that. Um, so thank you, everyone. And do enjoy the rest of your day as well. Thank you very thank you. much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye now. Bye.